My name is Kevin Duggan. I'm the Director of Development with Games for Change. I've been with the organization for, for quite a number of years now. My main responsibility is actually fundraising. So that's why these, these sessions are, are of great interest to me, uh, since it's really about how, how do we as a, as a field uh, get access to the resources to do the work that we, do, that we need to do. And these sessions, I think, are really wonderful because they're, they're great opportunities to hear directly from folks who are basically in the business of, of trying to make uh, the work possible. And it's interesting because the, the sessions sort of span the for-profit, not-for-profit not realm, uh, including government agencies, uh, which are really, really integral to the, to the work. Um, so some quick housekeeping before we get started. So um, you can in, in hop in, uh, you can double click on a screen to make it larger. So like when Ed launches his presentation, you might want to do that uh, to enlarge in your screen. Um, these sessions are pretty short, half an hour. Um, so the presentation, short, like 10 minutes or so, and then that should leave about 20 minutes for, for Q&A. Because, again, it's a short session, we want to get to as many questions as possible. We're going to do that through the chat field, text chat, uh, not video. And um, I'm going to ask you to hold your questions till Ed's done with his presentation. Um, and then we'll jump in and we'll get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, you know, and, and as always in these situations, try and keep your questions uh, brief, specific, and, and relevant as possible. Um, you can actually, as I think Ed will probably share his email address with, with you at some point. Um, you can also use the, the direct message function in the Hopin platform. Uh, and if Ed's able to respond, he will do so if we don't get to your, your question today. Um, and I guess that's it. So we guess we can just, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ed Metz. And Ed's title is actually an introduction in and of itself. Definitely the longest title of anybody who's um, oh no who's uh, participating in this. He is the program manager for the Small Business Innovation Research, SBIR, and the and SBIR SBIR and Education Technology Research Grants. Institute of Education Sciences, U.S. Department of Education. Um, I do note in your bio, Ed, that you're a developmental psychologist. Did not know that. Education research, not surprised by that. Program director, did know that. Uh, and you've been at the, the DOE for since 2004, looks like. Um, and the programs that you that you are involved in or direct are uh, provide seed fund funding and or for R&D and evaluation of innovative and commercially viable forms of education technology. Uh, I will quickly note that sure. that it also um, coordinates and is the, creates the Ed Games Expo, which is an amazing event in DC. I went for the first time last year. It was completely mind blowing. Uh, and I recommend it. Anybody who's in the games and learning space, this is, that's after the games are changed conference, that's your number two uh, event to attend. Okay, uh, take it away, Ed. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, it's always so great to uh, to connect with you during this time of the year, and so glad you made it down to DC for, for the expo. So hey, for the rest of you, thanks for coming out uh, for this virtual event today. Um, if you have seen me talk the last few years. Um, I'm probably gonna say a lot of the same things, but for those of you who are new, hopefully you'll uh, you'll get some good information to help you A, know about the program, B, decide if you wanna apply, and C, think about um, areas that I can provide further assistance outside of this session today. So as Kevin noted, I'm gonna talk for about 10 minutes and then we will move over to the Q&A to, to sort of get, get into the good stuff. Um, in terms of the title of my talk, uh, I lead a government program that provides funding to education technology developers, inc including learning game developers. And I think if you're looking for funding, I think obviously it's a program you need to know about. So 
Uh, my contact information is there. Please um, connect to me on Twitter and LinkedIn and shoot me an email uh, after, after this session to tell me what, what you're up to. I'd love to, to hear from you. So at the Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences, I lead the Small Business Innovation Research Program. And it's a program that provides up to $1.1 million to for-profit firms for research and development, for pilot testing, and for evaluation of new commercially viable ed tech games and technologies across many topic areas to support students, educators, board administrators in education or special education. So that was a, that was a mouthful. Basically, the program provides the funding for you to develop the learning games and technologies that are going to have a big impact in the field of education. And the program is, is indeed um, making good use of those investments. In recent years, millions of students have used the technologies out of the program. And um, we're really excited about that because they're having an impact on the ground. And um, we're looking forward to hearing what you're doing as well. So just some, some basic nuts and bolts. Um, I'm not gonna cover everything in 10 minutes, obviously, but hopefully these bullet points will kind of give you a basic idea of um, the structure of the program. We have about a $10 million annual program budget. And out of that budget, we make awards for phase one, and that's for um, eight months of R&D for $200,000 where the developer is creating a prototype of that um, game or technology. Uh, the phase two awards the following year after that are for an additional $900,000 for full-scale development and for more rigorous pilot testing. And um, we have a success rate in phase one of about 5% to 7%. So uh, we, we'll get about 200 applications and make about 12 or 15 awards each year in phase one. And then with phase two, out of the 12 or 15 phase one awards, we usually make about 40 to 50% of awards for phase two. So, um, so that's, that's what we've been doing in recent years. It's good for you just to know, obviously, that those are the hit rates in case you're interested in applying that it's highly competitive program. So the next opportunity for funding will be in late 2020 when we'll release the 2021 request for proposals. Proposals will be due about 45 days later. Um, right now, we're thinking hopefully getting the RFP out around December 1st with proposals due around January. So obviously having a little bit of technical difficulty here with Ed. Um, so Ed, I don't know if you can hear me, but if so, your screen froze. Maybe you can refresh. Oh, okay. Are you you're, you're back now? Great. Okay. Uh, you, you you froze there at some point. Okay, I'm sure I did. It was. I got. Okay. Too, many, too many words, I guess. I don't know. There you go. So right. um, so now in the remainder of my time, I'm just gonna tell you about some of the great projects we've funded in the area of uh, learning games the last 10 years. 10 years ago, we, we weren't funding anything in the area of learning games. And now 10 years later, about half of our awards are focusing on um, emerging te technologies that use game mechanics to reach, uh, to reach students and improve student learning. So number one, uh, Hololab Champions by Shell Games is a great example of a virtual reality um, learning game that 
provides um, experiences for students to learn science. Happy Atoms by Shell Games is another uh, one of our games which students use those um, molecular models. Students can use molecular models and um, build them and get feedback with using the app. Teachly's math learning games are um, app-based and students can manipulate those, uh, those questions they're asked and be given real-time feedback on how they're doing. And teachers are given the um, results in real time to, to capture how students are doing. Electric Fun Stuff has developed uh, a series of games through their Mission US program. One of the games through the Department of Education's SBR program is Up From the Dust. It's a game where students learn about the Great Depression. It's sort of a choose your own adventure um, style game where students have to drive the action with choices they make and to learn about the historical significance and content as they go. Filament Games um, was funded to develop a suite of science games 10 years ago. Uh, you Make Me Sick, Cell Command, and Reach for the Sun. Three great titles, uh, puzzle-based games for students to, to drive the action in learning science. Zoo U by Three Institute. Uh, these are social scenario-based games where students um, practice social and emotional uh, skills in the feedback is given once again to teachers to see how students are doing. Eco by Strange Loop Games is a, a game where a group of students go into a virtual environment. They're given a specific amount of resources and they have to learn how to collaborate, collaboratively build their, build their world but not use too many resources or they will run out. Descartes by Parametric Studios is an engineering game where students build a submarine or an airplane or a boat in the virtual environment. And they, using a 3D printer, they can actually print out the um, whatever they've created and build it and then use it in a real experiment. Empires by Mid School Math is a program where students learn math through actual um, experiences in a virtual environment. And uh, Pocket Lab by Myriad Sensors gives students the opportunity to, um, to do real world science using a sensor and attaching it to a car or something else that can um, track the data from their experiments and um, use it to apply to classroom learning. So I, I plowed through uh, 10 examples of games there just to provide um, you guys an understanding of the wide variety and the different types of games we'll fund. And uh, here's a quick slide just to tell you that 10 years later, we're seeing a lot of different kinds of themes. Um, moving away obviously from games that are digitizing worksheets or, um, you know, but instead giving students experiences where they're, they're responsible for figuring out answers to questions in different ways and problem solving through trial and error. Um, we're also finding more games that are operating as new forms of assessment, which, um, measure student learning in different types of ways. We're seeing virtual environments, we're seeing modernization of old um, standards like the molecular modeling set into, into the future of education. Uh, we're seeing opportunities for students to learn through virtual and augmented reality. Um, with artificial intelligence machine, and machine learning, we're seeing games that personalize the lear learning experience for students to meet them where they're at and to challenge them with harder questions or to provide scaffolding when they're not learning as well. 
We're also seeing our games provide that feedback to students and teachers in real time to understand how students are doing. Lastly, we're seeing a lot of games build in accommodations for students with or at risk for disabilities so that they, they can meet the needs of those individual students. So uh, very quickly, five tips if you're applying to the Department of Education's SBR program. First, um, please make sure your concept is new. It's something that is actually doable and intends to make a significant difference in the field of education. Research is at the center of the Institute's Small Business Innovation Research Program. So please make sure your team has a strong education researcher who's gonna be um, able to assist with um, research that is gonna occur before you submit the proposal and then provide plans for strong pilot research once the project is funded. We also focus on the potential of your games to be commercialized in the education market once you're done with project development and a way for you to prove to the review teams that you can commercialize those games is by including letters um, from your partners who are gonna assist with the dissemination and the sustainability of your games once they're developed. So those letters are gonna be included in your proposal and those are really important to, um, to getting uh, funded. As um, another key factor is that you have an a team that includes experts from research, from education practice, um, from someone who can actually develop different forms of technology and business expertise. Lastly, um, be strong on the intangibles. Obviously, you wanna write a clear proposal. You wanna clearly define the intended game. Um, you have to watch out for what is called scope creep, meaning that your, uh, the amount of funding has to be equivalent to what you're able to accomplish in the project. Um, you wanna follow the format of the request for proposals. Please also be mindful of updating your website and um, if you have a video demo, you can include that in your proposal. So those are just some intangibles um, to writing a strong proposal. There are, uh, much, there are a lot more funding opportunities to be aware of beyond just the program that I lead at the Department of Education. Um, our colleagues at the Wilson Center have this uh, website there that you can go to to get an up-to-date um, list of existing funding opportunities across different agencies. Check that out for sure. As well, there's a, an open call for applications right now from the Institute's Research Grants Program. Those applications are due August 20th, so you only have about five weeks to write that proposal. But if you come from an academic background or you have an academic research partner, this is a great program to be aware of. There are um, fund, there's funding for basic research, for development, and for evaluation. So um, please check out that, uh, that call for applications. As Kevin noted, I lead the Ed Games Expo each year. It's a public event that is um, intended to showcase all of the learning games and technologies that have been developed with the support of federal funding. And last year we had about 30 different federal funding agencies represented and more than 100 um, developers presented at the Kennedy Center. It's also along with coming to the event to, to try a lot of great games and meet the developers in person. It's a great opportunity to come to Washington DC and to meet with the federal um, partners who, who run these programs as well as a lot of other stakeholders. So um, right now we don't have a date for the next expo and obviously we're, we're waiting to find out if we can even host an event, but if we can, we're shooting for March or April of 2021 to have the next expo. So please uh, stay tuned with that. So with that, um, my email is there. As noted, I'm looking forward to talking to all of you guys 
um, over the phone starting in August. And please connect to me on Twitter and LinkedIn. But right now we can spend the rest of the time with some uh, with some Q and A, just to see if I can fill in some of the the details that I may have glossed over in this short presentation. Thanks so much, Ed. Um, actually, you know, for me, your slides actually stopped advancing at one point. Um, oh no! I, don't, I think other people it was okay for them, um, but if not, where do you make your your PowerPoint available somewhere or? Yeah, John, you got, are you guys going to publish those or please email me and I'll send my slides out. Okay. So if anybody else um, did not see the, the, all, the entire presentation, uh, we'll, we'll figure that somehow. Um, and so the question sort of coming in already. So uh, let's going back to Paulette who started this and she said, if, if the submission is not funded, will, will there be feedback given? And I know your colleagues in the IES, um, you know, I've been told that it helps to be patient and persistent, that oftentimes you don't get funded the first go round and then you get, you do get good feedback and for your next um, uh, resubmission. So is that something that you experience or? You yeah, you know, um, the first thing for those of you who are new to the program, if you send in a proposal, it's going to be reviewed by um, a panel of three government employees who are experts in education and technology and research. And um, if you if you don't get an award, you're going to get feedback from those reviewers on the score that you got. If in either way, if you got an award or you didn't, you're going to get the feedback um, and. Hopefully it will be very useful in making improvements to your approach and your proposal for the next time. Great, thanks. Um, so Ariel asks, have you ever seen a proposal that had to do with improving student deep reading, i.e. critical thinking skills and character development? Are these areas that you might consider? Yeah, I didn't get a chance to cover all the areas that the program will support projects, but um, critical thinking, reading, writing, character development, social behavioral development, all fit. And um, if you're looking to combine reading and thinking and um, social and behavioral development, that actually is something that sounds right in the middle of the bullseye. Um, and this is, you only fund uh, in the U.S., right? U.S. national companies, uh, or do you fund international? Yeah, um, that's correct. It has to be a U.S. owned and operated um, tech company. Uh, if you're out of the country, there might be a way to okay. collaborate or start a U.S. business, but um, it's a little, a little more tricky. You know, I'm not sure. I, I guess I've never asked this of you before, but why is it limited to for profits? you know because so much of this work is being done on the not not for profit front and is it is the thinking that the for profits have have a greater capacity to to scale um in the market actually um the program began in 1982 specifically to increase investment in the small business uh community and to build to build the capacity of the small business community and um, it was done to make our small business, to, to create greater innovations through small businesses. So on a national level, it's, it's intended to make our economy stronger and to have these small businesses get greater investments. And um, that's, that's why it's for for-profit developers. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, so Rod asks uh, about the August 20th deadline, NCER, deadline. I don't know exactly know what that stands for. Do they accept game proposals? What is NCER? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a research grants program and it's, it's, uh, it primarily is focused on academic researchers. If you look at the program and who's been funded by it in recent years, it's usually academic institutions and games are, um, are definitely, uh, in, are definitely fundable, but make sure you have a strong researcher uh, leading that application. And please email me as well, and I'll give you some more guidance uh, offline. Right. 
Uh, Nancy asks, do you look for deliverables to align with national standards? Um, how rigorous of an evidence base do you typically look for um, in funding a proposal? So again, does it have to align with standards? And how rigorous an evidence base um, are you looking for? Yeah, the um, if you're designing a game to be used in a classroom or to teach, um, you know, science or math or reading or any academic content, the best thing to do is to align it to standards so that you can have measurable outcomes and so that it can be integrated into um, the curriculum. Uh, at the same time, you know, we really are very interested in other outcomes, whether um, for professional development or 21st century skill development or for social and behavioral uh, development. So academic outcomes and other <laughs> outcomes as well. All right. Uh, so Stuart asks or says, EdTech is no longer a separate topic this year. How has that changed your evaluation proposals that use tech? Well, that we're talking now about the research grants program. And um, indeed, uh, the ed tech topic area was taken away, mainly because ed tech is now, uh, it's obvious that ed tech is, is central to every topic area. So um, you would just go then to that specific topic area with your tech proposal and send it there. Um, all right. And Gregory asks, kind of question I was thinking of asking, it's, it's, it's a big open-ended question, which is just where do you see the games for learning field heading? But I think, you know, you sort of have the, the big picture in a way that a lot of people don't. So I don't know if, the, if there's a quick way in the, in the three or four minutes we have left to sort of respond to that. Are there big trends that you're seeing um, either in terms of the, the kinds of proposals you're getting or just what you see when you look at the field? In games and learning. Yeah, I mean, as I noted, 10 years ago, um, we weren't funding anything in the learning game space. And 10 years later, um, half the awards uh, out of the program are for are for learning games. So it's been, you know, a great decade for for the emergence of learning games. And, um, you know, I think, I think students, uh, are excited about the, about learning games, obviously, and I think teachers are looking to connect to their students. So that that's kind of at an obvious level, but the future uh, for learning games, I think, is really exciting. Uh, the more games that can be developed to personalize learning and meet students where they're at, and uh, once again support students in with with topics that are are challenging, and then can we can we develop games that uh, are used to assess students so that if you make it to the end of the game, you don't need to take the end of unit tests or the end of year test because by completing the game, you've demonstrated mastery. So I guess that's my greatest hope um, in leading this program is that five or 10 years from now, we could have a you know suite of games that um, eliminate the need for traditional testing. How's that for an idea? Old. Bold idea. Um, I'm going to sort of uh, combine the two questions, one from uh, Elsa and Ben, um, which I think relates to this idea of socio-behavioral uh, games. And Ben says, would games that teach social emotional learning uh, be relevant, such as mindfulness or med meditation? Uh, and also would a game about a uh, gender-based violence myth acceptance uh, targeting teens and youth, it's not academic subject, but a socio-behavioral, is that, is that more relevant to like an NSF or a DOE? That's a tough um, it's probably relevant to both uh, programs. Um, I think for the SBI program or the research grants program, there is uh, maybe, more emphasis on whether something can be implemented in a classroom and in today's world can it be implemented in a classroom remotely <laughs> at a distance so 
um, that's those, but those are, those sound like great topics to focus on for sure. All right. Let's see if we can get one last question in. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, again, Nancy at, kind of doubles down on that behavioral and social emotional development skills of these 21st century skills of priority. Yeah. I think, right. Well, I mean, I think it's, it could be, um, built into, uh, games where students are learning content as well. So, um, that's, a, that's another opportunity. I mean, another trend is multiplayer games. Um, you know, what if the classroom of students were playing the whole game together? Uh, so, that, you know, I think five or 10 years ago, that wasn't actually feasible to do technologically. So we're just, we're entering a new phase where um, there's so much excite, so many exciting ideas and so much potential. So this group here um, of 52 of you, wow. Um, I look forward to, you know, hearing, hearing what you're doing and giving you feedback to, so you can, you know, sharpen up your approach and, and maybe, um, maybe be successful with the program I'm leading or any number of the other programs that the federal, um, federal program offices are off offering. So, uh, that's sort of, we've sort of run out of time. Ed, can you, um, can you post your email address to chat? Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, um, and also, I see that Stuart also posted a link to um, a funding list. I don't know if that's your funding list, because I know you have a great um, resource uh, table that basically sort of uh, summarizes a whole range of funding opportunities on the from the federal government. Is that list available somewhere? Is that is that link correct that Stuart posted? Yeah, yeah. Um, a year ago, we 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 realized it was hard hard enough for us to find uh, all the federal opportunities, and we know all, we know all of each other. So this year, we um, thanks to colleagues at the Wilson Center, we've we've actually got a dedicated website that you can go to, and we're, we plan to update it quarterly. And it's great because it has a list of all the federal agencies that will fund learning game proposals, and it has contact emails for for all the people like me and they'll, um, and that, you know, we're available to, uh, to talk to you guys. And again, where is that list? Is that that link that Stuart posted or is it another link? Um, it's, uh, let, me, let me get it for everybody. And I will put it in the chat as well. If I'm able to do this seamlessly, that would be great. And then it's, um, Okay, I'm copying now. I'm going to be pasting in one second here. Awesome. All right, awesome, great. There it is. So I, I can hang out for a few more minutes. Um, is that all? Is that okay? Absolutely. So, and actually, I see Mark Deloro just posted a question. Um, so Mark asks, hi, Ed, what do you think is more valuable right now in the age of pandemics, a game that reports statistics and progress back to teacher dashboards or an entertainment game with a learning angle that keeps kids playing longer? So that's, that's a lot. How about both? Yeah. Um, you could do both. You could do both at once, Mark. Uh, and money, he says. Um, so I think I think perhaps what's behind that when he, when Mark I don't want to interpret your question but about when you say more valuable um, whether you're asking you know what's what would do better in the marketplace or what's more from the government's perspective I think, which is um, more more needed. What's really exciting uh, about kind of entertainment games is um, if there's a learning component and you can connect it to learning that occurs in classrooms uh if you can get a large user base um from sort of independent entertainment websites then you can uh you have a sustainable game gener generating potentially more revenue and then have your you know your 
school-based version that might might have greater ability to be disseminated. So I like the idea of that uh, of that model if it can be pulled off. So Stuart asks, uh, is there an example of a, of a proposal you really wanted to fund but couldn't for whatever reason? And I don't know if that's something, oh you, can, I don't know if that's something um, you can really talk about. We sort of gen I, generalize. So. I think. I mean, you look at every idea comes that comes in, and every every idea is has so many great parts. Um, and you know, you wish you could fund all of them. Uh, a lot of them don't make it because there's not enough uh, research support, or there's a lack of. Um, clarity in terms of commercialization. So those are two areas that um, everybody can can focus on in terms of having a strong concept, but also having the research and commercialization capacity. So you see a lot of proposals that you feel have, have at the heart have a, an idea of merit, but may fall down because they lack the capacity or they lack the some some necessary component. Oh, absolutely. So, um, you know, that's, that's why I'm, I, I'm, I really believe that the group at Games for Change, uh, you know, really has the ideas and the concepts that are, are going to, you know, have the impact. So Frank asks, could you also speak a bit to what would typify your definition of an education researcher? Now I know, you know, Games for Change, we've, we've explored, um, the potential for grant research grants from the federal government. And I know there are organizations that that specialize in doing research um, that, you know, you know, we were considering, you know, a partnership basically. Can you talk a little bit about that? When what what is an education researcher is from your perspective? Well that's a that's a critical question. So I'm glad we covered that in the overtime here. Um, <laughs> Uh, the education researcher generally will have a PhD in a social science related field like psychology or education or sociology, political science. Um, perhaps most importantly, it's someone who has an active research program that is relevant to what you're trying to do. So if you're building um, a game about, you know, science, learning um your researcher would have an active research portfolio with with studying students um in schools and have maybe produced peer-reviewed publications to, to show the findings from their research so there's uh two tracks you can get an academic who you could bring on as a consultant or you could um once again work with a research firm that Kevin just mentioned, there are a lot of research firms out there that are now partnering with um, with startup developers to to add that capacity, and that's something that I can talk to you about on an indiv individual basis to try and have you find the right match for what you're doing. So often they will be university-based um, faculty or centers at a university that's specializing in this, or again there are for-profit and not-for-profit um, organizations that also specialize in the research. The ones who have active research programs tend to be um, academic researchers. So if you, you know, if you know one and they're willing to partner with you, that's great. Those can be harder to find. The, um, the research firms, there are a lot out there that provide um, that support for a fee but um, might be interested in a proposal with you. And then obviously um, you'd have to split the funds with that firm, but if you can get the award, obviously it's worth it. Right, often they, they will bring uh, expertise in the grantsmanship expertise as well and familiarity with negotiating the, the grant process. Um, all right, I think we might be running uh, running to our close here. Um, Nancy Nancy adds on to that that there are folks that um, will donate their time to do the research analysis and um, 
Yeah, if you find someone who can do yeah. that, then uh, that sounds great. Um, all right, I think I think we're good here, Ed. So thanks so much. Thanks for going going the distance. Yeah, uh, hey, thank you. Extra, uh, thanks so much. Um, I I said this earlier. I, you know, I I my I I miss um, being in New York at this event. It's the one event of all of them that it pained me not to obviously be able to to attend this year. So next let's year. hope we can next do year. it again next year. It's planned.